Hey folks, it's Andy Tyndall. The podcast is going to get kicked off in just a little bit. We want to thank you for tuning in. For today's episode, we get to hear from Erin Smart, who's a former Olympic fencer. She talks to us about the sport of fencing, the different weapons and how it's played and that sort of thing. But she also talks to us about what it really took for her to succeed to compete on the highest level and win a silver medal in that sport. But she also talks about what I call her secret weapon, which is resiliency to make it through all of the highs and lows of her particular journey. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey folks, welcome to the Human Side of Greatness podcast. I'm your host, Andy Tyndall. Today, our show is all about one word, and that one word is resilience. You'll hear the story of resilience through the sport of fencing. Yep, I said fencing. In fact, many people don't know, but the sport of fencing has been part of the U.S. Summer Olympics or the Summer Olympics period since 1896. In fact, it was one of the first five sports played. Our guest today is a former member of the U.S. National Fencing Team. In fact, she was a U.S. National Champion in fencing in 1998, 2002, 2004, as well as 2008. In fact, she actually won a silver medal for a team event in 2008 at the Beijing Summer Olympics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show former Olympian, Mom, and mentor, Aaron Smart. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Andy. <laughs> thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. So at the top of every show, we always kick off, you know, with just some, some real simplistic questions. And so right now, you know, folks can't get out and go see movies and that sort of thing. If you had your choice to go see a movie of a movie to go see, what would it be? A uh, romantic comedy? An action flick or maybe a documentary? What would you choose? Action flick. Action flick. Wow, 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 yeah. wow, 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 wow. Yeah. Uh, rated R or PG-13? Uh, probably rated R. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's, that's some good action stuff. <laughs> so in, in, your, uh, in your, um, uh, your fencing career, you've uh, traveled around the world, so... If you had um, a fully paid trip, didn't have to worry about Ooh. getting back by a certain amount of time, where would you go um, and what would you do? I would probably go to Southeast Asia because I've never been. I mean, I've been very fortunate with fencing that I've traveled yeah, throughout the world. I've been to... Um, I've been to Asia, like I've been to China, Japan, uh, Korea. I've been to um, Russia, all over Europe. I lived in Europe for a short, brief stint, but never Southeast Asia. And, and I've been to Africa, um, South America. But I, I think I just want to relax um, and do, int- I don't know, just do interesting, have interesting food. I would love to see Vietnam. Wow. Um, my My father fought in the Vietnam war and he told me stories of Vietnam <laughs> probably stories you shouldn't have told a six-year-old, <laughs> but so I would like to see Vietnam from a different perspective. So th- that was, uh, that, that would be on like Thailand, Vietnam, those places I would love to see. So one, just one add on question. I don't usually do an add on question here, but I, I yeah. think this might be good. Um, would you go by yourself a group of girlfriends or would you go with um, your, your husband? Uh, I guess the diplomatic answer is uh, my husband. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> no, you know what? I would love, you know, actually I would like to do my my husband and my college girlfriends. And we have uh, my, my college girlfriends, they have, been with me for my freshman year of college and our husbands actually get along really well um even better than some of us do at times you know so i think a trip with the husbands and my husband and like my college girlfriend like a couple's trip would be fun 
Well, well said. Well said. Good, yeah. good diplomatic <laughs> answer. I love it. I love it. I yeah. love it. So I know I, uh, I kicked off by letting everybody know we're talking about resilience and you have a, a very, very amazing, interesting story as it pertains to resilience. But I also mentioned fencing. Some of our listeners out there may have seen fencing, uh, whether on the TV or in a book or something along those lines. Can you just give, um, if you can give like an idea of how you would explain it to, let's say my nine-year-old daughter, if you can explain, hey, what is fencing? How is it played? How do you get, how do you score? Mm -hmm. So um, the basic concept of fencing is trying to hit your opponent with a weapon um, before they hit you. So you want to hit them. There are two people on a fencing strip. It's a long fencing strip and you move back and forth and you're trying to find timing the target to hit that other person. The point is not to hurt them. It's yeah. just to hit them. And the goal of a match is just to be one point ahead of your opponent before time runs out or, or hit that, the score before, um, before the, once the match is done. So you said time runs out. How much time do you have allocated to each particular match? Yeah. So in the preliminary rounds, um, you have around three minutes, but then in the later rounds, um, those are direct elimination rounds, very similar to how, um, tennis is structured. Like you get matched off with someone based on ranking. And those longer rounds are about the matches are, a timed nine minutes, oh, wow. but in reality, you end up on a strip for about 30, I would say 30 minutes because there's start, stop, start. Each time you get a touch, you have a break in between. So it's a little bit, I would say within like the 20 to 30 minute range sometimes. Okay. And, and uh, you mentioned the strip. So that's like the, I'll, I'll, I would equate it to like the runway at a fashion show or something like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a perfect way to say it. Yeah. And, and so what, what's the, the average length of a strip or the, the um, I guess, what would be the uh, the legal length of a strip? Yeah, oh my gosh, you're putting me on the spot of like the numbers and I should know this stuff. But I want to say it's like maybe 30 feet or so. It's like, I want to say it's, it's a fair amount of 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 length. Now I got to look that up again. 30, but I would, 30 feet is a lot of, a lot of yeah, runway no, right there. A, so it's, it's a, a lot of room. You're going back and forth. You're moving a long distance along the strip and you have your own guard lines, your center line, and then you have your warning areas like because you can push your opponent off the end of the strip so that they can, um, that where you can get a point if you push your opponent off the end of a strip. So that's, that's part of the strategy. Okay, cool. Yes. Cool, cool, that's cool. also part of the strategy. Yeah. So now tell us about the weapons that you would use. Yeah. So there's three weapons in, in fencing. There's a foil, epee and saber. I fenced foil. Um, the, the goal with foil, foil is to hit somebody with a point and then you parry, you can, you block them at parrying. Yeah. And then the target is your, um, is your, basically your torso, your chest and your back okay. with Ep with Epe, it's a heavier weapon. Um, and anywhere is the target. You just hit, you could hit their toe, your head, whatever. Um, and that's, then the last that's weapon, the beginner's version, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. The last weapon is uh, saber, okay. which is a slashing motion. You hit somebody by slashing. It's the fastest of the weapons. Okay. And the target is from the waist up, including the head and the arms. Wow. Yeah. So um, knowing you, I know that you're from Brooklyn. That's why I wore my <laughs> I love Brooklyn yeah. shirt today. Um, how do you get started in fencing? Yeah. Well, I did not know anything about fencing as a kid. Like when I, before I started the sport, um, my father had read an article about Peter Westbrook who had competed in the 84 Olympics. And he read an article about a foundation that Peter was starting. And at the same time, my father was also working for sports illustrated. Yep. And he had asked some colleagues like, what's a good sport to get my kids into that will get them into college. They, and someone told him fencing. And so it was kind of, you know, like serendipity there. It was like, he read an article about Peter starting a foundation for kids. And then he, some, a colleague told him about fencing. So next thing you know, I was fencing, starting the fence at the age of nine. But 
I was, I didn't know anything about fencing before that. And I was not one of those kids that was into like sword fighting. You know, like some kids are like, oh, mm-hmm. I watched Princess Bride and I love to sword fight. That was not me. We didn't even, I don't even think my brother did that either. We never got into that sword fighting kind of thing, except maybe what was in like, you watch on Star Wars, like the lightsabers. Oh, the lightsabers, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's oh, yeah. about it. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. so your dad uh, essentially knew nothing of the sport of fencing. He just knew education was important, and you guys, you and your brother. When I say you guys, mm-hmm. uh, you needed to uh, need to get an education and get it paid for. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause my mother was a New York city public school teacher. So education was always a priority in our house. Um, and my parents were athletic people. We lived across the street from prospect park growing up. So we always spent time like running, biking. I ran track. My brother played baseball, peewee football. You know, they dabbled with everything. My parents enjoyed tennis. So we like, we were very active family. So um, I think it didn't come as a surprise to me that my dad wanted me to try another sport. It was just like, okay, I'm doing, you know, something else to try. (laughs) So so he says, uh, he's like, all right, we're going to try this other sport. Did you ever anticipate it going as far as it has gone for you? Uh, in terms of the Olympics and all that kind of stuff? Not when I first started, but I will say that I, um, I my because my father actually, he, when he was working for Sports Illustrated, he went to the LA games. He was, he, he worked there as um, for Sports Illustrated while he was there, you know, it was like a work trip. And so I was familiar with the Olympics and I loved the Olympics, like, I mean, I grew up watching like a loving Flo Jo, yeah. you know, like Jackie Joyner Kersey. I idolize these women. Yeah. Um, I loved watching gymnastics. So I don't think I ever thought fencing would lead me to it, but I always wanted to be like in the Olympics. Like I knew early on, like, oh, the Olympics are cool and I want to be there. <laughs> so you saw it and even like regardless of whatever sport your, your dad might have suggested or kind of was trying to lead you and your brother into you're like, no, I'm going to the Olympics. That's that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to Yeah, I, I didn't know if I was going to like have to buy a ticket, but I was like, <laughs> but yeah. And I, I mean, I, when I, when I was, um, before I got really into fencing, I was running track and I even um, ran at the Colgate Women's Games and I got to run at Madison Square Garden. That's a big meet. So, that's a big meet. I know about that meet. Yeah. So I think, you know, like I had these little tastes of like, all right, competing on bigger stages. And I think that kind of like, oh, I want to do something. And for a while, I was like obsessed with gymnastics, but my mom was like, you can't do gymnastics. You're going to be too tall. Just forget. <laughs> that's that's not going to happen. She, she was <laughs> so, right. She was, she was right. Yeah. She was right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, so, so that, that's interesting. So uh, what, uh, what events did you run for, uh, for, for track? Yeah, I, I did. I, it's funny because I'm not a long distance running. I did like the 100 meters and I did 55 meter, meter hurdles. I love the hurdles. Um, but it was interesting. I never loved track. I, I did it because I, I just did it, but I didn't, I didn't think it was fun. I just thought, wow, this is boring. I just have to run faster than someone else. I like, I didn't, I didn't see what the strategy was. Mm, okay 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 so so full disclosure and, and there is i know there's strategy and all like there is but at my age i was like this isn't what i just run faster than someone i'm like huh so <laughs> I'm here, so this was my thinking all right so i ran track yeah. uh in, in high school and i think i did 200 400 and 400 really yeah. for me i i agree with you it was like i just got to run fast with somebody okay i don't understand the strategy i never understood it but i did understand that it was extra time after school in a co-ed spoiler <laughs> so, so from that standpoint it was uh it was pretty liberating um but i, I totally get it like at, at some point you're like okay what are we doing here like how do we actually score and so getting back to fencing it seems like that was much more of a clear picture for you yeah and i think with track now remember this is like my nine-year-old self telling me like what what's <laughs> Like yeah. I didn't know anything, but the, you know, I do think there is strategy in track now, like watching the, the high levels, like I, I get it now, but, um, for fencing, it was just like, whoa, it, you have to change your approach every time you fence someone new, you could be fencing a righty, you could be fencing a lefty, you could t- fence someone that's fast, someone that's slow, someone that's small, you're constantly 
always thinking and like, and I think I was like nine or 10 years old. I'm like, whoa, this is constantly changing. This is like, I, not only was I learning like a whole new language because the sport, it's like you have different positions, you have different like names for things. It was like learning a new language was also learning how to compete against all different people. Just, it was always like un, uh, peeling back the onion every day. <laughs> so would you say that in a, uh, whether intentional or unintentional way, it was almost preparing you for uh, life experiences as we know it today? Uh-huh. Yes. Oh, definitely. Um, we like to call fencing the physical chess, um, because for every action, you have to think two to three steps ahead and think of all of your opponent's reactions while you're doing that. So, um, you're constantly thinking, just going. And, uh, I do that like constantly in my head, like when I'm at work or just any, I apply it to all points of like, okay, if I do this, you know, X, Y, Z can happen. If I do that, maybe ABC. And then if I do the A, then maybe they do Z. And it's like always this constant. All right. The, the wheels are turning. Lots of, lots of strategy. <laughs> lots of strategy. Lots of strategy. Yeah. yeah wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So your dad's like, all right, we're, uh, we're, we're going to have uh, you and your brother do, uh, do fencing. And so you get started off and you get linked up with Peter Westbrook, who's, you know, pretty phenomenal by himself. What was that yeah. like and how, how did that get rolling for you? Yeah. I mean, the first, I think what's, was the coolest thing about fencing um, because it's such a small sport and small community. The first day I show up to practice like this, uh, the foundation, the Peter Russell foundation, I meet an Olympian, right? Like when do you go to like, as a kid, when do you go to your first practice of something and you get to be the best yeah. <laughs> you know? like right away? Right away. And I was just, I was blown away. I was just like, and it wasn't just Peter. It was like, he had his teammates there that have like, these guys were like NCAA champions, national champions, Pan American champions, Olympians. So like, I'm like meeting, oh, here's so-and-so, here's so-and-so. And and I think like, I was just in awe that day one, I'm like a nine-year-old and I get to meet these individuals and they're teaching me. I was like, wow, this is it was cool, especially someone that was a fan girl already of the Olympics, <laughs> you know, it's like, wait, you went to the Olympics and you have an Olympic shirt on, like you're wearing his like, you know, Olympic gear too. So it was like, it was jaw dropping for a kid. How much more did that inspire you to want to go forward? Even though it was your dad's idea, how much more did physically being there, um, being, um, at that first training with everybody kind of showing up, how much more did that inspire you to want to go forward on your own with it? Oh, just a ton. I mean, I think that that's part of the reason why I just love the sport and, and wanted to keep pursuing it is just like, I got to meet all of these individuals and work with them on a daily basis. And they would spend the time to talk to me. And also they're the, what makes our foundation, the Peter Russell foundation so unique is that, and everyone says this, it's, we're a family there. It's like, it's not just sports. It's, a family organization that really prioritizes lifting each other up and taking the time and being authentic. And I don't think you always um, get that in, in, you know, and sometimes your kids sign up for something. You're like, Oh, that's cool. You try it out. And it's, it's, it feels a bit transactional sometimes, but um, I think the difference is like, it, it really is a family that cares that has worked together for so long that have been on Olympic teams and national teams go to college together. So it's really a, a unique environment. Um, and I think that's what kept me in and drew me into to the sport. So at what point uh, do you kind of like start getting really good competitively and mm. you're getting all this attention? Like how old are you when it's, it's really starting to click that I'm, I'm good at this. Yeah, I would say it was, cause I started when I was around nine, it started, I started to get pretty good when I was 12 years old, like within a three year, two to three year time period, I was, um, doing really well. It was, you know, my parents started entering me into local competitions, like yeah. the Metro New York stuff. Then we started going to state competitions and it's like, all right, I'm winning at these. I'm winning at the state. And then it's like, all right, let's go to your first national like youth competition. And 
no, no one like knew who I was. They didn't know my teammates. It's the first time we're like getting out there. And it's like, and the best part is like, Oh wait, who are all these black people in the sport that suddenly show up? <laughs> so, so let's, let's go there because like coming from Brooklyn, <clears throat> coming from Flatbush specifically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, fencing is not even on the radar, not even on the map. So how do you adjust your brain, wrap your brain around that where they're, um, a, a large group of um, um, black kids in the school uh, kind of training with you <laughs> or was it, you know, just a handful and then it kind of grew after a time. How, how did that go? Yeah. So with the foundation, it was just like, it was a small group of us. Like I want to say it was like 10, 12 kids oh, wow. and we met on, yeah. And we met on Saturday mornings, but then the actual fencing club is like what you expect a fencing club to be like mostly white people mm -hmm. that are there in the evening affluent. And so we were only coming on Saturday mornings. So we didn't know what the real club looked like, like, you know, cause we were in the facility, but people didn't fence on Saturday morning. So that was the time that we were allotted. And so then when they said, okay, you can start coming in during the week to train more, like that's your progression. And then suddenly I'm looking around, I'm like, Oh, this is, that's the, the, those are the people that are, are extra, the, the Saturday people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, Oh, now this is what the, the face of the sport looks like. It's like, it's white affluent people. So it, it took me back like, okay, this is, this is different, but you know, it wasn't, it didn't come as a shock to me because no. like I, I, I grew up in Flatbush, but my parents sent me to school in Park Slope. I went to public school, but we went to school in Park Slope. So it's like, yep. It is most my classroom was like mostly white and and I was like one of maybe two, three black kids in the class. So it wasn't like, oh, my God, I went from an all black environment and then suddenly I see white people like in this. And so it wasn't that surprising to me, um, but it was it was eye opening. Um, to the people that I started to meet, it's like, oh, that person's a judge, that person's a lawyer, or a doctor. Suddenly I was surrounding myself with a, a group of professionals that usually were not in my parents' circle or our family circle. So that was that was also interesting. Very different to see uh, the different socioeconomic backgrounds of yeah. other people connected by this one sport. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, Tell me about how you and your brother get to actually participate in a sport together. Cause I know you had become somewhat of a child prodigy, but for him, it just wasn't clicking at that point in time. Yeah. My brother, now we can laugh. I always say now we can laugh about it because how much he's achieved in the sport. I yeah. mean, he, he, he passed me on <laughs> the sport later on, yeah, 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 yeah. but, but yeah, when we first started, I, I just took to it naturally. And I think because I did, I did a lot of ballet also growing like while I like my mom put me in dance. And I think the, the, the ballet helped me a lot because they're very similar positions. You have first, second, third. So that helped mm -hmm. me, I think just flow into the sport naturally. But my brother, he was awkward. He was a lefty and he was like gangly and just, it did not, it didn't click for him literally for, I don't know, four or five years. And he started, we started in the same weapon fencing foil and I would beat him. And, and it's like, he, you know, you beat your older brother at the sport. And I was, <laughs> and that's when the, our coach was like, maybe you should switch to saber Keith. And so he switched to saber. So that kind of like stopped the sibling competitions because, um, I was fencing a different weapon and he was training in saber, but even when he switched, he was, he was still st like on the smaller side and just never got the rhythm. It took him a while to actually um, excel in the sport until like he was in like 17 years old. So he was wow. at it so for, he was doing it for a it while. Was a while. Yeah. Wow. Oh wow, yeah. Wow. He was at it was a grind for like four or five years. <laughs> so, so tell me your parents' names again. Um, it's yeah. Uh, my, my father is um, Tom and my mom went by Liz. Um, uh, her real name is Audrey, but she always went by Liz. <laughs> that, that is a classic West Indian uh, parent. Yeah, right there, exactly. They, they always have a nickname or uh, yep. a, a, a catchy exactly. kind of thing. So yeah. I, I want you to share with the, the listeners um, kind of the, how your father and your mother got your brother to go to the school with you because you're the one who basically got the, uh, the, um, uh, yeah, I got the, the go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, cause our coaches pushed 
um, were pushing for me to go more the, the, the top coach at our fencing club. He was at the time, he's the um, head of Columbia fencing and he he was like, I want to work with her. And he actually thought he had never saw my the, a funny story. He had never saw my face. I already, I kept on the fencing mask and I didn't know what to do. He actually thought I was a boy because I was so fast. And then I took off my mask. He's like, that's, a, <laughs> that's God. he was like, wow, that's impressive. But he wanted me to work. And my parents were like, look, this is a tag team effort. Essentially. If Aaron goes, Keith has to go because my mom was like, we can't a be driving one kid to the city bring in, and have another kid at home, somebody watching at home. We just don't have the resources to do that. So no. if you want, if you want that one, you have to, the other one has to come along. So my brother was sort of like, all right, he, he got in because, <laughs> because I was, I was there too. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, um, it, I guess you can call it a package deal and, and it worked yeah. out great for both of you. Yeah, exactly. No, it, was, it worked out. And, and, and it really, I mean, it made the smart, the sport more enjoyable when you have a sibling involved in it, because it's something you, I mean, that's what kind of connects us. I mean, more than that, but it is our adjoining force that we have together of um, being able to just, just talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, from, uh, from the standpoint of your particular journey with fencing, um, with the environment that you're in, it's all new, it's all different. How pleased and excited were your your dad in particular and, and, and both of your parents for that fact? My 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 dad was kind of like one of those stoic individuals that never showed a lot of emotion. He'd be like, well, good job. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. You're doing well. Uh, but my mom was like totally like just really excited for how well I was doing. But I think she never showed too much excitement because I would be like doing well and getting into finals of a competition, top three winning. And then my brother wouldn't do well. So I think she had to create a balance wow. of emotion to not make my, my brother feel bad when he wasn't doing well. So there was this balance that she, she was like proud. She's very proud, but she wanted to, I don't think she wanted to put rub salt in the wound that my brother wasn't doing as well as I would do at a competition. So she's smart because it was a, uh, a very um, intelligent way of not showing favoritism to either kid one way or another. Yeah, wow. exactly. Wow. Yeah. While, while Mr. Yeah. Stoic is just over there like, yeah, Hey, good job. Uh, yeah. Good job. <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, from the, from the standpoint of, um, of your life journey, when does adversity really show up for you? Yeah. I mean, I, I have to say I was very fortunate because adversity didn't really show up for me until after, well, you know, I, I say my first, where I felt the, the like pain was when I didn't make my first Olympic team and people were like, what was you? Like you didn't <laughs> make your, but you made a few more after that, but it was like, in the, I didn't make the Sydney team. I was the fourth okay. and they, and I traveled to Sydney and my brother actually made that team. And so it was, I was disappointed that I never got put in into the team event and I didn't compete. So that was, that was hard for me. Um, but what made it that part hard was that my mom had was battling cancer. She had been diagnosed with colon cancer um, right before the Athens or excuse me, before Sydney. And um, she had decided to, she was so tough. She basically doubled down on her chemotherapy so she could travel to Sydney with us. So she, she essentially said, I'm going to Sydney with my kids. I'm going to watch them compete. I put, all this time and love into them um, uh, that, that she like expedited her chemo treatments to watch us. So I think that was hard for me that I couldn't compete. And while she was there, she was um, there yeah. but I mean, that was kind of like my first bit of adversity, but the real hard one was in 2006 when my father passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack. Um, and it was after yeah, it was two years after the Athens Olympic. So he had seen my brother and I um, make both the, you know, seeing Keith make the 2000 team, seeing us both make the 2004 team. And um, 
he yeah, unexpectedly had a heart attack walking through Prospect Park. Um, and, and at the time I was living with him, with my father, and I realized like, wait, I haven't seen, I'm like, where's dad? He's supposed to be home by now. And um, I got to receive the phone call that he had um, had a heart attack and they had found him uh, in Prospect Park um, there. So yeah, that was, that was uh, one of the first setbacks. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that because, you know, um, in the beginning of our conversation, hearing you talk about Prospect Park and the different sports, the fun, the joy and all that kind of stuff that the, uh, that your family had there is, I mean, is direct contrast to your dad passing away. And I'm, I'm really starting to hear that. Um, and, and so did that, did that dampen your spirit for the sport? Did it change your view of, Sp- of Prospect Park? <laughs> did, you know, it's, it's so funny because not funny. It, it didn't change my view of Prospect Park because my father loved the park more than anyone I knew. He walked that park every day. Wow. And I think that was where he was meant to, to honestly be like pass. You know, it's like, where is someone's happy place or why do things happen when they do or what? My, my father loved the park more. He would just sit there on some Sundays, take his newspaper and sit on a bench and just read there. It was, it was really like he had a connection with that park. So, um, and it never, my, yeah, I think it, it, the, the park holds a soft spot in my heart, really. It's great. Um, uh, what it did do was thrust me really into the sport again. Um, because it, I, after my father passed, I, I suffered from d- depression. I was, I was emotionally a wreck. I had never lost a family member that was that close to me. So, it was, it was hard. And my brother told me, he's like, you're depressing to be around. I don't want to, he's like, I don't feel like being around you because you're not fun. Um, no one had ever told me that in my life. And I was just like, man, I, I mean, I, I put myself in therapy at that point. I was just going to ask realized, you, what did you do? I was just going to ask you. That. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I knew that it wasn't something I could figure out on my own. So I, I, I sought out professional help and spoke to someone um on a regular basis and i realized i needed to distract myself with something i love and i threw myself into the sport wholeheartedly um and just like that's what i did to just distract myself on a daily basis it was like all right i need to focus i need goals and because after the 2004 Olympics, I wasn't sure if I was going to continue to compete or not. So I was like, still like in it, but I wasn't like a hundred percent in it. Like even me, like at that point, like even on a bad day, I was still good. So I was just like, <laughs> sort of dan- <laughs> I was still dancing with the sport a little. So I wasn't, I didn't have to like train that hard to do stuff. So, but I, I put myself back into it um after after my father father's passing so you were on the fence so to speak yeah but yeah I'm, i was i was i was definitely on the fence <laughs> um, walking a thin line with it walking a thin line with it so you you go you say hey i'm gonna i'm gonna double down and i'm gonna go all out um was he the driving inspiration for getting recommitted getting refocused to just getting to your ultimate success with the sport yeah, I mean him as well as my my mother because she was also, um, my mother's battle with colon cancer didn't end in you know in two thousand. It, it continued like she had a relapse starting around that same time two thousand right, right around right after my father passed like in the latter part of two thousand six going to two thousand seven. So, and my mother was living in Florida at the time. She um, wanted to be in somewhere warm like Jamaica. So the closest she could still do without moving to Jamaica was be in Florida. Um, and, uh, so I think it, it, for me, it was a lot emotionally. I was, you know, my, my mom's battling, yeah. you know, with cancer, my father passed. And so both, I think both of those were drivers for me with, with the sport to get back into it, just to, to distract myself. Because if not, I'd be like, probably partying, drinking, just 
you know, <laughs> not doing good things for myself. <laughs> Maybe retail therapy too. Who knows? <laughs> right, who knows? right, exactly. Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? That, that. So you know, from uh, from from you know, looking at the family, it seemed like it was one main cohesive unit. So now the the leader of the crew is no longer there. You're yeah. you know, kind of you know, back and forth, um, making sure you're you're getting your mental space taken care of because that's that's a super important thing that a lot of folks yeah. don't realize nowadays. Um, but then you're, you're going knee deep with the, with the sport. Um, yeah. what happens next? Yeah. So, um, going into 2008, I mean, I, that's a, the sort of the, the next big, like chapter of the book, right? 2008. Um, uh, my brother and I both decide we're, we're going to make the Beijing team basically we're like, all right, let's do it. And and we both said, this is our last, our last run. Um, we had decided going into 2008, I, I knew that I was closing the chapter on, on my, my competitive life in the sport. Um, and my mother was again, like still battling colon cancer, but her, her body was, was, it, it wasn't like, the last time it was just deteriorating. She was deteriorating quickly. Um, but it, my brother had, was at a world cup in, um, I want to say it was, gosh, where was he? Tunisia. He had come back on a plane ride and I saw him. I said, you look weird. And I, he goes, what are you talking about? He's like, I was like, something's odd about you. Like he had these spots all over his head, mm. these blood blisters Next thing you know, I said, you need to go to a doctor. He actually checks himself in the hospital. They quarantine him. This is like before quarantine. Before was quarantine a thing. was a thing. Wow. Right. Wow. And because they had no idea what he had, he ended up having some sort of blood disease. Like um, uh, it's a, a rare, um, it, it, it's almost like cancerous, but not cancer. It was um, it called ITP, but it's a blood disease where your white blood count goes too low. And you could basically bleed out to death. He had somehow after this trip to Tunisia had contracted something or something happened in his body and his body basically started to, to give up and not be able to stop himself from bleeding. So if you touch him, you could see blood boil, like start to happen all over his body. And he had went to, and we noticed it because he went to get a haircut and you could see where the barber touched his head and you could see like the, almost the fingerprint of the barber. Cause it was like the blood spots that happened. And so he was in, um, I see you at the same time, my mother was battling, um, cancer and she was distressed. You know, like she barely can keep herself alive at this point. And with my brother's condition, she was just like beside herself. So, um, my mother, I went to stay with my mother for like a few weeks in May and cause it was right around her birthday. And I'm just calling my brother. He's getting, he, he he's, they still like trying to figure out what's wrong with him, but he yeah. can't do anything. And my mother ends up passing right after her birthday while I was in, with her in Florida. And, um, it was, it was tough, um, to see someone gradually, um, just be taking away from me. And, but I'm so blessed that I got to spend the final moments with her, we got to just reminisce and um, talk about life and how proud she was of us. So it was, it was great um, to, to be with her during those times. Um, but um, fortunately, you know, we, I, I believe there are things as angels and miracles because after my mother passed, my, brother became became like basically was on the path to rick had a lights out turnaround recovery where he rehabilitated like of his body like basically they put him on steroids and all these things which is not allowed for an olympic athlete um but in this case on, in this case yeah. you have to do it. in this in this case they allowed they, basically there were a lot of ex exceptions made but he was able to to make a full recovery um to to compete in in the Beijing games how, over like 
a two month period. That's what I was going to ask you. How long was, was he diagnosed and then to the recovery? You're saying two yeah, months. He, he was, di- he was diagnosed. I want to say that was around February, maybe March or April, eight, March, April. Cause he could not visit my mother. Um, he could not fly to, to, to do anything to see my mother during that time. So I was the one that was going down there to visit her. Um, so it was probably he, his full recovery happened around Ju- June, June. That was like on the path to like by that from, from that time period, like February, June and um, was his recovery. So in, in all of I've, that I've looked up about ITP, yeah. From what I could understand, it seemed like it was a, a form or offshoot of um, leukemia. I know. So are you and, and, telling and that's me, it's like, you're telling me he yeah, beat but, leukemia in, in two, two plus months? Yeah. And it's crazy because I, I, you know, I don't want to say like, oh, it's cancer, but, you know, because it, it's, it, it is. And, it is. and, and it's, it's wild that when you hear this story, it's like, wait, how did he do that in a three to f- like a two to three month time period? Like, how is this even feasible? A, that it came out of like, literally came out of nowhere. My brother was like, like literally a, a, a athletic specimen. Like at that point, like we were at training at our peak, we were both at our peak going into 2008. And then just out of nowhere, this happened. And, and yeah, and he beat it. Um, That's and has been, thank the Lord, healthy ever since, um, since that happened. That's um, a bona fide miracle. No joke. That's, that's yeah. a bona fide miracle. Um, yes. really sorry to hear about your mom passing as well, because thank you. Yeah. Uh, she, you know, like any mother, like a real mother is the, the glue of the family. And yeah. so she's not there anymore. How do you and him function? Cause I mean, you're the last two of the core four. Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, it was, it was again, a tough period. I went to like, after my mom's mother's death, I still had to compete. Like I was going to world cups. I remember I was at a world cup and I just broke down. Like there was one competition. I just broke down crying in the middle of the, f- it wasn't even cause I lost. I just had this uh, emotional, I would just have these emotional waterfall moments of just feeling so overwhelmed just with, everything that it was hard. And I was very fortunate that I had my brother to, that I could call or some competitions. He was there with me, but someone that I understood what I was going through on a competitive level, but on a emotional, personal level as well. So we did, you know, it was a lot of talking, um, and, um, also a lot of praying. Um, I, I really looked to, to the the religious side of the, my mother was a very religious woman, woman. She, um, we were raised Catholic and, um, it, you know, I, I, I traveled with my Bible and read it on many times when I needed to find strength, um, and pray, um, to, to just get me some of the, through some of the, the tough times. So did you get that from just from your mom specifically? Is that what that was that where she found her strength and she made sure that you and your brother could develop or tap into that same um, yes. Source power. Yeah. Yeah. My father was, <laughs> my father is, uh, never really went to church. He was okay. the guy that my mom said, all right, take them to church this, this Sunday. Cause she couldn't make it. And he literally gave the guy a 20 said, come back with my change. <laughs> <laughs> that was my dad. Wait, wait. He said, come back with my change. Meaning you get $5 a piece for each kid that you make get, go through the door kind of thing. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Can you come back with my change? And I was like, dad, that's not how it works here. Uh, and, and so but my mother, however, was very, um, very like, she even had her um, spiritual cards all around the house. Like God is with you. Your her mantras. God is with you. You have the strength. You're given blessing. You know everything throughout the house. So it, it that, yes, that came from my mother. Um, the the spiritual side side of things. Um, yeah. So, so now your mom passes away, and um, now you're left to figure out. Okay, I'm still competing. I really want to, you know, um, still be successful in the sport, not just me, but my brother as well. How do you make it? Obviously prayer, obviously you're falling back on your training and all that kind of stuff. How do you fully burst through? Yeah. I mean, 
it's <laughs> one of the one of my my first coach he was um very much into mental preparation mm-hmm. which is a lot of visualization imagine yourself doing something even if you're not doing it yeah. even if you can't even if you're not say if i had like a broken foot even if you can't compete today think of yourself winning think of those actions you want to make i did a lot of mental visualization about what i can achieve and what i want to achieve what were those goals and i that really helped guide and put me into a mindset a good mind space of where 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 do i need to be where do i want to be how do i get there um so i think that was like one of the one of the other key things that helped me get to the to to that to to, to, to not give up how you know yeah, to, to not, not to not just give up. yeah not to give up just to not throw in the towel and i have a lot of teammates along the way that have given up and i'm just like it, they're just like it's too hard i'm scared i don't want to do it i you know a lot of excuses and i just kept telling myself just these positive mantras and visualizations to really um help me get to beijing but also like how to excel to do do what i do you know yeah just just to <laughs> get your mind right to. so you can you can be the best version of you simply put yeah yeah yeah, yeah. exactly so now exactly. you get to beijing and and you, you you've done your visualizations you've had great coaching do you tap into something special that normal people don't have because athletes have this different gear, this different mental gear to really bust through adversity. Uh, you, you see yeah. it in, in many occasions when maybe a relative passes away or they have a severe injury and they bounce back from their injury and wow, they're, they're a champion again. Is that yeah. kind of what you tapped into this, this secret formula that the rest of the world doesn't know about? Uh, yeah. And then I don't, I don't know how to explain it, explain it ever. It's, it is something I, 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 to, I, so I'm still very close with Peter Westbrook. Like I'm still part of our foundation and he and I will talk about it. He's like, what is it that, that Olympians have like, are these, we top, I, I don't know what it is, but you just, you just find it within you somehow. Like, even if you're like, Oh man, I can't do this. There's no way. I, there, like you, you, people will say, no, you can't do it. And you just, Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do just this. Watch. I, I, there's something in you that's just like almost a little diabolical in, in a way that's just like, oh, I'm going to find that that last bit of energy, wherever it is in my body, I'm going to find that last mental piece that will get me to what I need. And I will do anything to do it. I'll do anything to bust down that door or whatever it takes. And you find it within you to, to excel and push through. It's just this weird sort of like, like putting your car into like a six gear or something like, all right. Or even an imaginary gear you didn't know was. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So now Beijing is silver medal time, right? Yeah. 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 So tell me, tell me about that. Tell the listeners about that. Like how does that all play out? Because you got a silver medal for your team event mm-hmm. and then Keith got one as well, right? Yeah. So going into the team event, we, my team and I knew, what, were the odds in our favor? Not necessarily, but we knew if we had a great day and we, all the planning and preparation, if we stuck to the plan, it would work. And our first match was against Poland. Um, we knew that we could beat them because we just felt it and we did. And then our next ma- match was Hungary. That was a, a tough one. And we were able to pull out. I mean, if you look at photos of me after in some of these, like after those matches, you'll see this look of, like, I, like, oh crap! I did just did it. I did it. Ring the bell. We did, I did it. it. I did it. I was like, oh my gosh, I did it. But it was like, it, we weren't like the Michael Phelps of the of, of of the fencing world. Like we were, we were just like, all right, if we have that good day, stars align, and we do what we what we planned it and execute well, we can achieve something big, and. And the whole time I was competing, like my brother was right there in the stands. Keith was there in the stands watching me, which is you're not allowed. Typically you're not allowed to do because he competes the next day after me. And so our coaches don't really like you to be at the fencing or you're watching other people compete the day before you're supposed to like disconnect the day before not, you know, get in the zone. 
Uh, yeah, all that stuff is thrown out the window when you have a sibling. And exactly. That's, <laughs> yeah. So Keith's there. And there were moments during when I was competing that I was like a deer in headlights, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here. Or like, And I, I could hear my brother's voice like screaming, guiding me through it. And I mean, I remember when we got into the gold medal, when I was secured a medal, um, you know, because we're going into Finland, Russia, either it's gold or silver. That, by the way, that's the best feeling in the world when you go into a match knowing you've got an Olympic medal. It, it was surreal, but I was just like, man, there is, my parents are angels here with me because I could not, I mean, it was, I just, you know, I still pinch myself. I mean, what we had been through, I was like, there was a reason for the loss and, you know, like, I don't know, my parents sacrificed so much and I knew that it was for them that God had put me in that place. And I was carrying along their spirit and their energy at that moment. Um, and it was the best, one of the best feelings that I've ever had in my life being on, you know, the podium stand, but I'll be honest. Um, one of the hardest things was after winning, um, the silver, I, I knew that Keith was competing the next day and I was like, I just kept thinking, it's going to suck if I have to go home with the medal and my brother doesn't get one. We both got to get it. We both got to get it. <laughs> I, and and I was just like, this this is going to suck. And that next day, I've never felt so much um, just angst, nervousness as I did. I had more nervousness for my brother's match than than for mine. And that whole time, literally every, every bout, everything that he's going through, I was praying like, please God, give him, give him, give him the strength, <laughs> give him, give him the medal. Come on. Give him the medal. I was like, please, please give him after everything he had been through, especially. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't supposed to be there. He wasn't I mean, supposed to be there. That's it. He wasn't even supposed to be competing. They said he wasn't going to, when the doctors first diagnosed him, they said, there's no way you're competing. You're not going to compete in Beijing. And to see him up there competing, I was like, him more than me deserve, deserves a medal. Um, and and he, you know, and his and his matches were a miracle match. I mean, it literally came down to the wire of like some referee calls and everything. And when when I knew he was guaranteed medal, that was that was a, I mean just a great feeling. And knew that our parents did a, did a, a an lights out job um with the gifts that they have given us yeah Yeah, amazing you're like hey pilot turn on the engine on the plane we're ready to go home yeah yeah, exactly it's a wrap (laughs) (laughs) oh that's so great i'm I'm so happy for both of you and i know your brother has Mm -hmm. the uh the the pbs uh short film uh stay close which was amazing 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 anybody who's listening out there go check it out on pbs uh just a, a fantastic uh short film uh put together um so I know we're coming down to the, the end of our time here. And uh, I, I just wanted to kind of get a sense of um, the one question I'd like to ask on the show is what does the human side of greatness look like to you? Because you have this spirit of resilience. You have this way of overcoming. And I just want to get your perspective on that question. Yeah. You know, the human side of greatness, it, it First thing, I think it's such a great. There's so many ways you can take that. True. You know, it's it, you know, it's to me, it's it's uh, Peter always says it to me to to much to those who much is given, much is expected. You know, it's it. I think it's in Luke in the Bible, and um, to me, when you are given gifts and and what, no matter what that gift is, it doesn't like, it doesn't have to be an Olympian. You, it, there's so many ways that people are so fortunate to me. The greatness is when you can give that back to others. I've been, I've been given so much. No one becomes Olympian by themselves. There is a village of people along the way that help you friends, family, strangers that help you in the littlest things. And if you can give that back to others, when you are able to, I think that to me is like um, the human side of greatness. It's just like when you can, when you're just given things and you're unwillingly, like you just do it selflessly, um, can give back to others and give and pay it forward. Um, I, I, I think that is 
I've been a recipient of it. And I, I, and I hope that I can do that for others. Um, I was a recipient of, of um, Peter's greatness. I mean, if without him, I would have never been in the sport. I would have, you know, like he started a, a foundation that opened many, that changed my life that, that, that really opened so many doors for me. And um, I'm so appreciative of it. Um, words can't even explain. And I hope that I'm, I do that for younger kids coming up and um, can pass that gift forward. So you're, um, you're talking about your, your work as a mentor. So yes, yeah. touch on that too, real, real quick. Yeah. So I, I, I volunteer with the Peter Westbrook foundation, how I started um, in the sport and the kids still meet every Saturday. And instead of 12 kids, there's about 120 kids on Saturday mornings. We have a wait list of about 200, but we teach them for three hours. Every Saturday we, we do calisthenics, we do fencing. We do um, we also offer now um, tutoring um, no matter what grade they're in, academic tutoring, we help the academic tutoring Great. to, um, we help them with SAT prep, PSAT prep. Um, so it's now a robot, a robust nonprofit that offers so much, but it's not just about the fencing. It's about the life skills that we're teaching this kid, these kids. Um, and we, it, Peter always says, it's not just about being, we love our Olympians, but it's about being an Olympian in life and doing greatness in life and helping others and being the best human you can be making the best choices. Um, that's what's important about what we instill in the kids and what we can offer to them. So of those hundred plus kids, are they allowed to uh, go in during the week or is it just on Saturday still? Uh, they're allowed to go in during the week. And now the fencing club looks quite different than it used to. It's not as, you know, it's diverse. It's not as it's, homogenous anymore. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we have diversity now. That's, that's fantastic. All right. So yeah. final, final question. And I, I love our time together here. Final question. Yeah. Uh, if you had to have a quote or uh, a model that you live by, what would it be? <sighs> I always think of my first coach. I always think of hard in the practice, easy in the battle. And, and, um, I, I don't know. I try to instill this in my three-year-old, but he probably doesn't get it so much. <laughs> but I always think if, if, if you put in the work, if you put in the work early on, if you just push yourself, it becomes easier down the line. You pushing yourself through those hard moments. Um, just it makes things easier along the way and even when you think mentally oh like it's like it, also another quote i like is how you how you do anything is how you do everything right so you just gave us a twofer thank you i, I know i know i know it's like because those are because i was like all right you gotta excel at trying to excel at everything you do or at least give your best give your best give your best give your best at everything you do. that's like kind of what I try to do. I mean, and sometimes you fall short, which is, you know, you know human. It, you're human. We're all human. We all make mistakes, but at least if you know, you're, you're giving your best. Um, I always feel like I never have to look back and say, what, what if, what if I'd done that differently? What if I'd gone that way or done this? Why, if I, why didn't I lunge a little bit more and I could have made, <laughs> you know, it's like, I never have to look back at my practices and I always think like, all right, very right, just try to give a hundred percent. Just leave it all on the strip. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Aaron, I really want to thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show, just sharing your story of resilience, uh, not only just for, for you, uh, but for rep representing your brother, your mother and your mm -hmm. father and all those kids at the foundation and Peter Westbrook. So thank you for being on the human side of greatness. Thank you so much, Andy. This has been great and wonderful. Awesome. Talk to you soon.